Okay, international travel outside of the United States here on the Middle Way. Uh, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and it's Monday morning. Uh, Alexander Moravar joins us. Uh, where are you, Alexander? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, the Valley of the Sun. Okay, and you're a traveler, and you went to Austria uh, in Europe, and we are going to talk about your adventures getting there and getting back. And then we're going to talk about the uh, you know the dynamic of international travel. It still isn't easy, and it won't be easy for a while. So tell us about your trip, Alexander. It was a wonderful trip that we pre-pandemic we did every summer actually with my daughters and my lovely wife. Um, the advantage that we have in a way is we're all dual, at least dual citizens. So neither side can really keep us out legally. We have the right to go there. It doesn't mean there are no problems when you when you enter and exit and prepare and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it was an experience in many ways. Uh, surprisingly enough, a relatively pleasant experience. There was a lot of uh, formalities to fulfill, pre-registration uh, on the way there, uh, COVID testing on the way back. So there were lots of things to do. And the one thing that struck me as really odd during the entire trip, nobody ever asked me to ask uh, me to show them the vaccination card. <laughs> I thought that would be, would be my number two right after the passport. And I literally <laughs> never had to show it. <laughs> and that's interesting. So, you know, uh, how, how long were you there? How long were you in Europe, in Austria? Uh, we were there for almost two months, actually. Uh, we, we stayed in Austria. We didn't cross international borders there because at the time, rules were changing pretty much every other day. So you would uh, go to Italy for a quick trip and then probably not be able to come back because of some lockdown or some border closure. So we decided to stay put, which probably was a smart move. Uh, and enjoyed the country. Well, I, you know, I think uh, well, let's take a moment and digress, if you don't mind, Professor, um, just to talk about um, if you could make the distinction between life in Europe, life in Austria now, life in the United States. It's different. Uh, it has, you know, I, I, I think it, is, it has been made different by the Trump administration, but it is also different in general. Um, you know, we have, in, in, a, in a way, we've gone on separate paths because of COVID. Can you talk about life in Austria and, and how it is compared to life in the U.S. now? I mean, it certainly is influenced in many ways by COVID, but I think uh, given the, the past four years and, and probably beyond that, of course, Europe was um, swerving away a little bit from being a full-blown ally of the United States, and that still shows today. Uh, what, what strikes me in the COVID context really as, as a, the biggest problem, we have a global pandemic, not a, a localized pandemic, but we still think we should solve them incrementally, locally, regionally, nationally, rather than globally. I mean, the pandemic doesn't know physical borders and does not respect them, um, but we think we can solve them uh, locally. And the Europeans did the same thing. I mean, there was no European Union response that was particularly uniform. It was also country by country that responded, uh, which uh, partly might be good. I mean, uh, COVID, even COVID's not the same whether in Sweden or in Switzerland or in, in Spain. There, there, there's different manifestations of a health crisis, of course. But to cope with the problems, I think more cooperation would make a lot more sense. Uh, you asked about life in, in Europe generally, I think it's a little bit more relaxed. There's a little more willingness to believe uh, government measures uh, when they're being adopted. There's still reluctance to do it, but not such you know, partisan response to what's being done, depending on which, which party is in power. Uh, so if a health department comes out and says it might be a good idea to put a mask on, then people by and large say, let's do that. Uh, is there perfect compliance? Absolutely not. Is there conspiracy theories in, in European countries? Absolutely. Demonstrations you see recently in Italy, which has a, I think an 80% vaccination rate already, they're aiming for 90%. There's public demonstrations against the past that they're requiring for pretty much anything. Interesting. So um, people generally believe the science. Uh, uh, is, it, is there any um, you know, kind of thing that we have here where people are, they feel it's their right to reject the vaccination and they will go to great lengths to oppose it, uh, to sue over it, uh, to do um, protest over it, and ultimately to threaten uh, those who are calling for vaccinations with violence. 
uh, is anything like that? There is, but I would say overall, and again, it's many different countries doing different things and realities are not all uniform throughout Europe, of course. I think there's less of it and there's less willingness to actually re re resort to violence and intimidation. I think that is just not so much present. What strikes me as very similar, those who actually are opposed to mandates, including mask and vaccination mandates, are on the right end of the political spectrum there as well. So it's parties that are operating far to the right of the center that really embrace the idea of, of mask uh, resistance and vaccination resistance. And, and you know, QAnon is, is not as present as it is here, but it's been seen there too. So sometimes at demonstrations, you would see an actual Q flag popping up. So I, I wonder if it's, um, you know, like monkey see, monkey do sort of thing, where people in, in other places, for example, Austria, other places in Europe, um, you know, have this protest, uh, assign this prote protest to a, a political you know, point on the spectrum uh, and do it because it's been done in the US. I mean, have we been a leader in ridiculous protests and are people following that because we have? Well, I, th I think honestly, we, we should be patriotic in responding to that question too. We, we are leaders in protest and that's a good thing, actually. Our first amendment is a very good thing. Uh, and the, you know, the, <laughs> okay. the, the, the right to speak freely doesn't necessarily have a quality test in it. So, uh, you know, uh, smart speech and not so smart speech, uh, speech are equally protected. And, and I think that's a good idea. Alexander Michael John's marketplace of ideas still works largely. Uh, we are also, I think we are exporting uh, strange speech and strange behavior to a certain extent. I, I don't believe people in Europe might be different in other continents. I would say where there's more monkey see, monkey do <laughs> attitude. Uh, in Europe, it's not just because there is something done in the US, they'll do it as well. But it certainly is an example that's being done and then is being re embraced and, and regurgitated in a way in a local format. So it's kind of translated into the local, uh, again, mostly on the political spectrum, right wing extremist uh, agenda, and then is embraced and used in a way um, without necessarily having the made in the USA label sticking out of it. But, but still, I mean, there's, there's certainly some uh, inspiration coming. We go one step further, you know, in the US, I mean, there, of course, there are people who protest this sort of thing if we're on one mm, charade or another, but um, call it a political charade. Mm -hmm. um, and the other side, you know, we, we have we have a divided country over it. And um, there are people on the, you want to call it the left side, perhaps, who think that those who are protesting against something that will save their lives is ridiculous. Um, and uh, irrational and suicidal, if you will. Um, and so we have, we have a very sharp division in this country on that issue, among others. So query, um, does the divisiveness also exist in Europe? Does it exist in, in Austria? Are the people on the other side, you know, do they feel that those who would protest and um, be, quote, hesitant about vaccinations and masks, they think that, that those people are nuts? What do they think? Uh, I, I would probably say there is a larger percentage of the population who embrace uh, the, the validity and value of vaccinations and probably the, the fact that wearing a mask is a good idea, even if it's inconvenient to say, let's do it. We, we do it in the places where it's necessary. Go to the supermarket. You don't want to you know, breathe on your salad and then somebody else buys and eats it. Uh, so I think there is more qualitatively speaking, more understanding and quantitatively speaking, there's more people who actually embrace reason. Uh, there is also the other side, of course, that embraces conspiracy theories and, and rejection of science. I think it's less the rejection of science as such, which has been a, uh, a clear presence, I think, here in the United States since, since at least COVID began. And, and I'm, I'm sure it's rooted in something much, much earlier. It just came to the forefront so much. Uh, so my, my, my understanding is from, from spending time there and of course intensive conversations is that the percentage of people who just are reasonable is a little bit higher and the percentage of people who are manifestly unreasonable and believe conspiracies is, is relatively smaller. Are, they, are, the, are the ones who think that it's reasonable to wear a mask and have a vaccine, are they, 
um, are they divided from, are they uh, angry? And uh, are they, uh, what do you want to say? That, uh, the, 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 um, are they um, concerned about the rationality of the others? Um, I, I mean, do we have the kind of divide there that we have here in terms of uh, left and right, yes and no, uh, or is it a more uh, understanding, appreciative kind of division? Well, I think it's not so much set up for divisiveness that's sort of a, a one versus the other, or two options only as we have here because we have a two party system. If you look at pretty much every single European country, you have at least five and sometimes up to 25 political parties that span every, I mean, so many aspects of the spectrum, the political spectrum. So you, there's not really the, the duality in a way. So you can say there's the conservative and there's the liberal because there's five conservative streams and, and five <laughs> liberal streams. So it's a lot more split up in many ways. Well, that, uh, speaks, which, that speaks highly of having multiple parties, doesn't it? It, it does in <laughs> part. I mean, if you look at the reality, Italy being a good example, of course, uh, you have so many parties that forming a government is sometimes quite difficult and they have elections multiple times a year, at least in the past. So it can also go the other way. But I think being pressed into just two options, which, of course, if you look at both uh, in the United States, they're not homogeneous by any standards, so they all, all have these various streams in them. But they have to kind of come together in a tent, ultimately, which there you can just build a new tent eventually and, and form a party. Uh, since we're talking party politics, I think the COVID uh, issue, but also the, you know, the climate, climate crisis, of course, has really boosted uh, one particular party, which is a little bit on the left, but not so much the Green parties. Anywhere in, in, in European countries, there are uh, strong Green parties and they're more mainstream than they were initially with a very strong uh, ideology that runs towards climate change uh, and health prevention as well. Oh, that's great. It's a great connection, but it's also important to know that people care about it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very worrisome. Uh, um, I've had conversations with the um, uh, the journal the journalism program at UH Manoa, mm -hmm. and they uh, to to the, to the person uh, they feel that the most important story in our lifetimes is none other than climate change. Uh, with all even with all this other distraction and noise and trouble, um, climate change is the thing that's existential. Right. Um, and I totally agree. And I'm happy to hear that people are aware of that. What do they What do they think of Glasgow? What do they think of uh, Biden's uh, stand on, on climate change? Uh, what do they think about the effectiveness of the, you know, I wouldn't call it reconstituted group uh, at Glasgow? I think there's a lot of weariness, of course, um, especially towards the United States, because we have been very inconsistent in, in our US-Europe relations, and especially also in the global climate change response in many ways. So I think they really want to see concrete action, not, not beautiful words and not speeches. I believe Biden did relatively well speaking, but then he's, of course, you know, has, has multiple problems at home with getting his package passed. And it seems that uh, we have another uh, kind of winning shot coming out of West Virginia now that it might be even more in peril than we think. So uh, Europe knows that, and Europe certainly wants action instead of words. And I think that you will see that in Glasgow. You, you saw it at the G20 meeting already that there's, yeah. there's hesitation and there's uh, a real demand for concrete action. Uh, history will look back on these times and wonder why humanity couldn't figure it out uh, that is, if there's anybody left uh, to look back. <laughs> well, let's hope history will have an opportunity to actually look back. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you know, in general, what is life like in Austria, in Europe? Well, through through the lens of Aust Austria, for example, you know, a lot of people I know, and we talk about it all the time, is uh, we stay home. We don't go out much. Um, people ask us to dinner and to vi visit them in their homes. And we say, no, uh, we're not ready. Uh, people want to have parties. They want to return to the time of uh, social engagement, if you will. I mean, physical social engagement, not the kind that Mark Zuckerberg is selling. Uh, that right. kind of engagement. Yeah. And, and um, you know, they, they resist. I resist. And a lot of people I know resist. And so you have a change in the social fabric and in the social connection, if you will. And I wonder, if, did you observe anything like that in Austria? Uh, and what's the dynamic on that? 
Very much so. I think that's probably a pan-European phenomenon, like a global phenomenon, really, that people are eager to go back to socializing and then having normal relations with, you know, their peers and and just being able to get outside and do stuff. Uh, Europe, especially Austria, from my experience, had a lot of lockdowns where people were literally told, do stay at home unless you need to go to the hospital or to the supermarket. And that went for months. So people would not see their friends, would not go to church, would not attend meetings, would not really socialize at all. And there was a really um, a burning need, I think, for, for doing that in the summer. Uh, when a little bit of opening happened, you were still had mask requirements, you still had very strict uh, requirements for going into public places. So if you went to a restaurant, the waiter had to ask whether you were vaccinated and look at your, your card, or you were tested, or you were uh, recovered. If you didn't have one of the three, they call them the, the three G's uh, in the German language, uh, you, were not, you were not admitted to the restaurant. You couldn't attend concerts to the extent that they were in. You couldn't hop on a train. You could not really go anywhere. Uh, so people were eager to do that. It, it, it went a little bit the other, the wrong way then. The numbers right now are pretty bad. I think they're operating at an incidence rate of about 390 or something right now, which is very high. Uh, U.S. put them back in, in uh, group four of the of the risk countries, actually. So there's, there's concern at this point in time because lots of people then overdid it and uh, did their partying and did their hanging out. And then, of course, numbers came back. And they also opened international borders to an extent, so summer vacation was possible again. Uh, and lots of people brought infections back from that, which of course produced the backlash. So there's by no means perfection there, by, 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 no, by no means whatsoever. Uh, there's a lot of errors, uh, trial and error going on as well, yeah. and a lot of frustration too. But the, the universal approach, I think, is similar to here, that at some point we need to figure out a way to getting back to something that is resembles normalcy. How about, how about you? I mean, did you get out as much as you wanted? How was your life affected while you were there for uh, your trip? Uh, did you, you know, I mean, everybody likes to walk in Austria, uh, mm -hmm. take take to the mountains, if you will. Um, right. Did you do that? Were you able to get out? Uh, what 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 quality of life did you have while you were there? Uh, surprisingly, very few limitations as long as you followed the simple rules of putting your mask on when you were in a crowd and making sure you had your, uh, your document with you that showed you were vaccinated and or one of the three Gs. And there was really a limited uh, number of things you couldn't do. Uh, it was a market trend away from city tourism actually to tourism in the countryside. So places like farms, um, little country hotels were overbooked. Uh, cities were empty. Uh, I did both, actually. We went on a, on a weekend trip to one of the largest cities in Austria, Graz, in a, in a city hotel where, you know, you had your standards, you could get in and you felt pretty safe, actually, and you could even do your breakfast buffet with all the precautions that they put in place. Uh, we also did a, a lake vacation where the hotel itself uh, gave the option for unvaccinated people. You can get tested every day for free. So they just went to a little station, a, a nurse came in and performed the tests and then people could stay there as well. So it, it was it was well organized. Uh, yeah. What we didn't get running here, like the public testing, for instance, uh, centers for testing were up and running. You just signed on, signed on online. You, you got your appointment, you went in, you got your test results 30 minutes later. So um, let's talk about, um, let, let's talk about, um, uh, the tour the tour boats you know the, it, it, 10 minutes don't go by alexander when i don't get an ad uh, on my email that i should i should go with viking in europe i should get on a, a river there and and, right. and, uh, and then there are you know a number of other cruise organizations that are asking me to book stuff um and i say to myself oh and my favorite one is is the caribbean um you know lots of you know sail by haiti and wave yeah. Right. Uh, just, <laughs> <Haiti>. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how real is that? Are, are people traveling? We talk about travel today. Uh, people traveling, um, people, um, you know, going on the river cruises. Uh, um, you know, what, what? how do they react to this sort of ad? I know how I react. I said, that's ridiculous. But but hey, maybe other people do that. Uh, is, is tourism coming back? 
It, it is coming back. It's coming back sort of based on the rules in place. When you when you look at Europe, for instance, it was a much bilateral approach. I mean, the government of one country would say, we feel that the other country next to us is safe enough, so we'll open the borders as long as they follow our rules. So you had certain uh, groups of tourists coming back in. There was an absolute non-existence, of course, of American tourists at that time, because coming in was very uh, restricted. Uh, and no Chinese tourists who usually make up a large uh, portion of summer tourism specifically. Uh, so if you look at the monetary losses that tourism was suffering at this time and still is suffering, that's, that's enormous. Uh, there was a lot of social legislation adopted to basically catch the most severe damages of, of non-tourism basically, to make sure that hotels could survive and restaurants could survive to a certain extent. Uh, but that didn't guarantee that everybody actually did. So I think tourism was down to uh, you know, the single digits when it comes to percentage at the height of the, of the shutdowns. Uh, and then started kicking back in uh, during the summer, actually, uh, especially late summer. So the, the two months I spent there, actually, Salzburg is one of the three most visited towns. That's my hometown in, in Europe. So you normally have hundreds of thousands of tourists uh, meandering around uh, in any given week. Uh, first week I was there, there was probably two or three that I encountered on a, on a two hour long walk <laughs> uh, through town. Uh, towards the end of our stay, two months later, it clearly had changed and there was larger groups, especially of certain uh, tourists, Germans, for instance, Italians, Swiss, uh, Eastern Europeans were allowed back in after the numbers had gone down. So they, they tried to get people back in uh, as quickly as possible, but also as reasonably as possible. Uh, did it work out? It's, you know, we'll probably need 20 years of, of very thorough sociological and medical research to work through what really happened during the, the COVID pandemic. I think partly it worked, partly it failed. The numbers right now again, are not so encouraging. Yeah, as you said, trial and error. We learn in this case by trial and error. And different places diff have different trials and different errors. And right. it, it would be so much better if they were scientifically coordinated. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the uh, you know the the economy for a moment. Um, you know, I, I feel that um, that that business always wants to get back in business. Uh -huh. They they or you know they've got to survive. They've got to have a bottom line, or they got to go out of business, which would be tragic for each business and for. Right. A collective of businesses, um, so they are pushing government. They're always pushing government, lobbying everywhere. You, you can you can see they're lobbying government should reopen things, and uh -huh. um, you know that was a huge mistake back in March and April last year, um, and it may to some extent be a trial and error mistake now. Um, but you know the process: business pushes government to reopen. Right. Um, but query: How is business doing? Um, you know, are, are people not going back to work as they are in the U.S., you know, the, the resignation phenomenon? Um, are, they, uh, are they working at home or not working at all? Are they, um, they hoping the government will take care of them uh, to the point where they don't have to work? Um, and how is the production economy doing? How is the supply line economy doing? Um, how does that differ in Austria? I would say there's a lot of similarities. I'm not an economist, so I can only speak to the extent that I actually know something about that. The supply line certainly is the same issue in Europe. If you look at especially uh, gas, that basically all comes from Russia. Russia uses it partly at least as a political tool as well. So there is a, a definite problem there. If you look at the news coming out of the UK, Brexit didn't help either. So, uh, I think Europe as a whole, including former Europe like the United Kingdom is suffering quite significantly. There is a shortage of uh, truck drivers there as much as it is here. So supply is definitely an issue. Uh, I would believe that the, um, the, the move away from actually working and towards the home office was a little less pronounced in Europe. There were more attempts to actually keep people on the job as much as possible. Uh, there was more social legislation than here to cover uh, unemployment and make sure that people would actually not fall into homelessness and starvation. Uh, that also has been phased out at this point in time. So we're in a similar situation in many respects, I believe. Uh, overall, if you look at the overall European mentality versus US mentality, 
uh, you use the word business. I think we are probably 80% business think and 20% social think. Uh, Europe is probably more 60, 40. <laughs> uh, and that might have really come out very clearly during this pandemic. I think so six, 60 was... business, 40 social or the other yeah. way around? Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't throw every single European country in the same box. I think there's different approaches in different places. But if I would have to evaluate the European Union as a whole, I would say probably somewhere in that in that region. I mean, the, the European Union itself, of course, is a business arrangement. It's basically a, an international organization aimed at fostering business and thereby preventing war. That's the, the original idea of the European Union. But they also have vast uh, social legislation at this point in time. There's much being done that is just, you know, connected to business inseparably anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, during during the pandemic, my wife and I have seen, uh, we've seen the big computer companies get bigger and more arrogant, if you will. There's a really interesting movie, Alexander, called The Billion Dollar Code. And it's the story of a, a, a cell of uh, German developers, artists, artists and developers who invent what amounts later to Google Earth and Google Earth uh, somehow steals it from them, uh, according to the movie. And um, this is a really phenomenal thing because you see the strength of, of the European effort in programming, but it's completely overwhelmed by the American capital effort in allowing for really, really big computer companies, <clears throat> software companies. On the other hand, I have observed uh, a number of companies, even in Eastern Europe, I'm dealing with one now in Kiev, um, mm -hmm. who first class, first class software, uh, another one in Istanbul, first class. So, and I, you know, in the soft underbelly, there are a lot of competitive software companies. Mm -hmm. and, and I suspect this is part of the kind of global view of, yes, we can sell software across a border. All we've got to do is get down there and learn how to make it. Um, do you find that? Is there a, a heightened awareness of software and computer activity, uh, networking activity, virtual, virtual activity uh, in Austria and in Europe? Oh, absolutely. I think it's, that that's the same as here. There's, a, there's entrepreneurial spirits out there operating in, in the reality that, you know, social interaction was pushed towards the, the virtual world to a certain extent during the, the past 18 months. Uh, and they certainly have grown in many respects. I think the Europeans also, at least to a certain extent, had a bit of a regulatory approach towards the freedom to replicate and duplicate and, and quadruplicate and involve everything in one big corporation that took on Google a little bit more aggressively than we did here in this country when it comes to personality rights, for instance. So I think the jurisprudence also, if you look at the European Court of Justice, however imperfect it is, uh, it puts individual rights uh, at, a, at a slightly higher level of protection than we, we do when it comes to interaction with big computer companies and also the protection of the right not to be pursued for the rest of your life for everything you put on Facebook or whatever it's called now, uh, <laughs> has found a little bit more sympathy with the judges and the regulators there. So I think we're probably a little bit more mellow in Europe uh, when it comes to uh, to that, a little bit more human. <laughs> <laughs> there was a piece on 60 Minutes last night of uh, Yu Yuval Harari, the Israeli author, um, about the you know the future of humanity and and how AI is going to change us and uh, it's it's inexorable you know um, but I also want to I wanted to ask you about the movies um, you know we are staying home so we spend a lot of time with Netflix and Amazon movies and others and um, I have noticed that there is a lot of movies first class movies movies I, I you know to a certain extent you think well it must be emulating Hollywood. They must be using Hollywood talent, um, but but no, I think they're you know authentically, culturally, uh, ethnically European. These movies, and I see a lot of European movies, subtitles sometimes even in English, um, uh, many times even in English, and it's not just the English. It's uh, it's many countries. I mean, I saw a movie not too long ago. I considered first class. It was it was made in Bulgaria or. 
Hungary or one of those. And it was a first class movie. And I'm thinking that everybody's getting in on this because it is so international. And so travel, you have travel by way of movies. It's a great travelogue. Um, it's, a, it's an exposure to, you know, the culture, the history of a given place. Um, and, I, and I believe that we have, we've sort of gone to another chapter on European movies in the American market. Um, but what about Austria? Is Austria watching only American movies? No. Is Austria watching European movies? What is Austria watching? And what are you watching when you're in Austria? <laughs> we, we spent about every waking hour watching soccer, actually, because there was the soccer championship at that point in time, and my girls were very much into that. So that would be 80% of my TV watching during the time we were there. Uh, but certainly, if you, if you look at the uh, cable TV channels there, there is an existence, a preponderance probably of, of American and other sort of, you know, internationalized, which is also another word for American type movie. But there's also a proud presence of older historical uh, nationally produced movies which Austria had a bit of a tradition actually back in the 1950s 60s early 70s of producing what we would now partly call kitsch but kind of cute kitsch movies uh, usually historical movies usually comedies of that kind they're playing routinely on tv people are actually watching those as well they're kind of culturally relevant too uh, and I, I absolutely believe, I hope it will happen, actually, that uh, European movies become more of an international you know, item of, of sales, not just something that you watch at a, at a uh, you know, offbeat uh, cultural event every once in a while or go, go to Cannes and see them there, but something that actually people in cinemas would be watching in, on Netflix and so on. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in that field, but I think there's a few out there. I mean, Austria has its famous expert, Christoph Waltz, of course, who made it into uh, mainstream American movies, including some very good ones. Uh, but there's more than that. What about uh, news? What about uh, cable news? For example, um, if, if you're uh, in Salzburg, can, can you um, look at uh, MSNBC? Can you look at CNN? Can you look at can you look at Fox News if you want? Uh, you know, is that all available around Europe? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then there's quite a few European networks as well that are out, out there. I mean, from Deutsche Welle, BBC, um, French National TV that broadcast in English and other languages. So if you want to, you can see anything. There's a lot of local news as well that people watch quite a bit. Uh, I think the news network still, especially in, in modern and central Europe, is dominated by sort of the, the official news stations, which, which were initially government run, but now are more, uh, you know, balanced corporation. They have a, a legislative mandate of being balanced in many ways. Uh, the, the one dis difference that I always notice very clearly is there's a separation between the broadcasting of facts and the broadcasting of opinion. Uh, I know when I grew up, you could you could easily say that because you had one person who would or two who would bring the news and tell the facts. As, again, facts are not absolutely objective, but as neutral as possible. And then another person would come on who was actually the designated opinion person, and that person would then comment on the news. So you could easily figure out now that the station is giving me the facts or trying at least, and now they're bringing their opinion. Uh, and I think that is a is a still there to a certain extent. I think it's a, it's a helpful tool for people to actually understand that facts sometimes need to be viewed as facts and also tested against other facts, not just other opinions. Facts are so important in any, in any country that would claim to be a democracy. You know? um, so before COVID began, you know, ThinkTech was covering the migrant issue. The migrant from the Middle East, uh, Central Asia, the migrant issue from Africa, or you know, especially sub-Saharan Africa, but also Northern Africa, and um, you know, it was it was tragic, but it was also uplifting, in the sense that Angela Merkel, you know, could welcome people, and the, the country would be behind her in that. I miss her. I want you to know. Uh, <laughs> So, so the question is, uh, you know, I really, we haven't covered it during COVID, not as much. And I wonder how the migrants are doing. I wonder how the migrant issue is doing. Are they still coming? Is the government permitting them or ba barring them, uh, on, you know, on the basis of COVID uh, or other considerations, uh, political considerations, if you will. Um, so how, how are the migrants doing in Austria, for example? 
Um, I would say the, the COVID emergency certainly prompted governments to use that as a, as a tool for being a little bit less welcoming and a little bit more restrictive. Uh, crossing the Mediterranean, for instance, has clearly done down in numbers. There were still numbers coming and still terrible accidents with lots of people drowning, boats capsizing and so on. Uh, but I think COVID was used in part to really curtail migration to a certain extent. Uh, there was also the issue with, of course, the, the Schengen area and the, the question of where people would have to apply for asylum. There were ongoing discussions, of course, about especially the southeastern Europe. Uh, Turkey now is, has used the migrant issue in part as a bargaining chip as well about releasing or not releasing migrants into the European Union. The same goes for Belarus and, and, and the Ukraine in, in a certain extent. So that, that's certainly definitely a big issue out there. I don't think migrants have benefited in any way from, from COVID. There was no increased sympathy. There was no understanding that people can be returned into uh, countries that are much less equipped to deal with a, a global pandemic than what are currently. So I think it's still the same problem as before. Uh, since you mentioned Aunt Angela Merkel, of course, who, who um, I think everybody appreciated, irrespective of political opinion, just appreciated as a person. And, and there's a, a sentiment of, of sadness that she's leaving the political stage. Uh, what, of course, the, the, the relatively open door policy uh, five, six years in the past also caused was a right wing backlash in Germany in part. I mean, the AFD, the so-called alternative for Germany party that made it into certain regional parliaments now and, and also the federal level uh, grew in support because of the perceived liberal open door policy. So I think it all, all it always has, you know, different kinds of effects, whatever, whatever you do. <laughs> right? that, yeah. that crisis certainly was a defining moment for Europe in many ways. Yeah, well, the, the migrant issue was a defining moment to uh, change things maybe forever. And now the, what do you want to call it, the, um, the changes uh, to that um, by COVID, um, that is also a defining moment for Europe, I think. And uh, going forward, it'll be sort of a, hmm, uh, a settlement of those two, you know, a, moder a moderation in the middle somehow. Well, let me, let me, you know, whenever I come back to Hawaii from a trip and I fly, I fly into Hawaii, I always have an emotional reaction about returning here, uh, comparing the places I've been in the place, you know, in Hawaii that I'm returning to. And I wonder if I could ask you personally, your, <clears throat> you know, impressions, your reactions as you, as you flew back to the United States from Europe. Uh, how did you feel uh, landing back home again? It was certainly a, a positive emotion, not only because I hadn't seen my parents for a while, so there was there was the, the personal connection, but also coming back always is a is a good feeling. I, I, as a dual citizen, I always feel at home in two countries. I, I, I spread my love equally, and I also spread my criticism equally. Uh, when you don't live in a country, I think when you're away for a while, you come back as a, as a very strong patriot, but a very critical patriot as well. <laughs> uh, so that, that's always my feeling both ways and, and wherever I go. Um, would we, would we, I think what you have in Europe is a, is a very welcoming culture, and that certainly was not affected by COVID at all. So when you, when you land there, and Hawaii might be very similar to that, you feel at home, even if it's not your home. And, and COVID did not really distract from that. So I think that the welcoming character of people is still there. Uh, and, and I also don't believe that it, it turned into a massive anti-European agenda. So um, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, you know, the firebrands that they're sometimes saying there will be a German exit and the Poland exit and whatever in the future. Uh, I think Probably Brexit was a good thing for the EU, like a wake up call to probably do something different. But I don't see the Euro skepticism being such a strong element as some want to make it appear, including in the media. Thank you for that. That's, that's a, important to know. <clears throat> We're out of time, uh, Professor. And I, I want to ask you one last question, you know, uh, to make um, sort of a closing summary. Um, uh, of, of how you feel international travel is doing and how you feel uh, that it will be going forward as we go forward, hopefully out of COVID. Uh, can you talk about how um, it has affected international travel, how it is affecting it, and how it will affect international travel? 
Well, I would say it has affected tremendously. I mean, the, the international travel is down to a, a marginal percentage of what it had been before. Uh, on the other hand, you know, global travel is not just a thing of numbers, it's also a question of quality. Uh, and maybe it gives us a moment to pause and say, what kind of global travel do we want in the future? Do we all be squeezed into a, a gigantic airplane together with 800 of our best friends? Uh, and, you know, after COVID, we'll breathe the, the safest air in the world, but we still feel as if we are sardines. Or do we want to have options for more quality travel that might be a little less, but a little better in, in certain ways? Do we just want to go to the, the places where everybody goes and just walk in a line and look at Pompeii or the old town of Salzburg? Or do we want to do tourism in the sense of exploring countries, which I think was the original idea of it? And I don't know whether COVID will help in this, in this way. It certainly has reduced numbers quite a bit. Uh, whether it has improved quality, I, I would be able to say, hopefully, there's, there's this effect in a way, because ultimately, it will also improve the quality of, of the travel itself. I mean, people who, who, who have a better experience might be much more, been, it might be much more beneficial to them than if they go more frequently. Uh, their experience might be better and their understanding might be better. And one thing I think that we all need is, is going out there into the world and trying to figure out what other people are thinking uh, and, and engaging with other cultures and other opinions, right? Yeah. We can't all live in a bubble. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Alexander Moreover. Thank you very much for coming around and, and discussing your trip with us. I can only say that... <clears throat> I, I wish I had been with you in between the soccer matches to take a two week, uh, rather a two, a two hour tour of Salzburg. Um, and I think if you do that, um, you can be and you are a Renaissance man. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> Very much appreciated. A pleasure as always. Thank you, Jay. <laughs>